I was just taking part in some Sonic coloring. But do you know what Sonic coloring reminds me of? That's right, my favorite Wii game, Sonic Colors, a game that's so unique and has such an awesome lighthearted tone and aesthetic and such tight gameplay that I could call it, in fact, I will call it, the best 3D Sonic game. Now, I know that's quite a bit of a title to give a game. In fact, I know a lot of people are probably going to the comment section right now to angrily tell me that I should be saying that, say, I don't know, Sonic Generations or Sonic Adventure is the best 3D Sonic game. But no, I'm pretty certain it's Sonic Colors. See, I have a little bit of history of this game. I was 12 years old when it first came out, and I got this exact copy right here from my grandfather. Shout out to Papa, by the way, for making today's review possible. And I fell in love with this title for a wide variety of reasons. So this is Stuff We Play, home of everything weird and retro. And today we're doing a deep dive into Sonic Colors and why I think it's the best that 3D Sonic has to offer. Wow, now that's a title screen that brings back memories. I can't believe that this game came out all the way back in 2010. So Sonic was in kind of a weird spot when Colors came out. Four years prior to Colors' release, the series had seen the release of Sonic 06, a spiritual successor to the Sonic Adventure games that is widely regarded to be an absolute train wreck, featuring numerous glitches, improperly coded mechanics, and even an interspecies kissing scene. Uh, it wasn't good. It's a game that forever tainted Sonic's reputation, and it can be argued that the series never fully recovered from that title. Two years later in 2008, though, Sonic Team developed and released a new title, called Sonic Unleashed. This new game introduced a new boost formula, well, new for 3D games that actually previously debuted in Sonic Rush for the Nintendo DS, but this gameplay style made Sonic feel faster than ever before, and featured Sonic going on an adventure around the world, hence why in some regions, it's just called Sonic World Adventure. It's a game that looks gorgeous, and despite being on the Xbox 360 and PS3, it still holds up graphically today. However, it also had some odd quirks, such as featuring a werehog that, to be honest, just wasn't a lot of fun to play as. Think of God of War, but really stripped down. Apparently, the only reason the werehog was even added to Sonic Unleashed was because many of those at Sonic Team were worried that the game would be too short if it just consisted of the boost-style stages. But as they later realized, for their next title, it'd probably be good just to focus on the style of gameplay that people actually liked. Fast forward to November 2010, and we saw the release of Sonic Colors for the Nintendo Wii, a game that did just that and featured exclusively boost-style Sonic gameplay. And yes, that's Colors spelled the American way. Yes, I'm in Canada. Yes. People in Canada often use the British spellings and not the bastardized American spellings of words. But also, yes, this is an American copy of the game. And even then, the Canadian version of Sonic Colors actually used the American spelling. Like with most games that are released in Canada, we just get the exact American versions up here. Anyways, despite being on the Wii, which was more comparable in power to the older GameCube than the Xbox 360 and PS3, I think it's fair to say that graphically, Sonic Colors has aged incredibly well. The game is vibrant and looks incredible in motion. I love how absolutely colorful the world is here, which makes sense, you know, seeing the title. My only real issue is that at a standstill and when upscaled through playing the game on the Wii U like I am, it can look pretty jagged. But trust me, for the time, this looked fantastic. Of course, I may be jumping in a little too far too soon here. Graphics are good, and yes, characters are awesomely expressive, but what's the story here? Apparently, Dr. Eggman has decided that he wants to give up on being evil, and to apologize for his past misdeeds, he has decided to open up Dr. Eggman's incredible interstellar amusement park a massive theme park set in space that comprises several actual planets, all with different themes. 
However, Sonic and his buddy Tails realize that something seems pretty fishy about this, and thus they go to investigate the park. Shortly after taking a space elevator and arriving in the park, they realize that their hunch was correct. You see, it seems that the park is actually just a front frag man to kidnap and enslave these little alien creatures called Wisps. Sonic and Tails even befriend one of them, named Yakker, and Tails makes a communication device that can actually translate what he's saying, though it's not very reliable. Honestly, for all we know, this little guy could just be calling Sonic and Tails a couple of dumb cunts throughout the entirety of the game. Anyways, after the first world, the game just consists of Sonic, Tails, and Yakker going world to world, literally, with Sonic beating up robots, running through loops, and trying to stop Eggman's plan for interplanetary conquest. Gotta be honest, after all the 3D games and Sonic Adventure up to this point featuring a huge monster that needs to be stopped by the end of the game, with these ranging from water dragons to the devil himself, it's really nice to be back to a game where it's just Sonic going up against Eggman and trying to stop him from being a comically evil villain. It's just a classic Sonic plot, except instead of Eggman putting little animals into robots, he's doing that with Wisps here. The deepest the story ever gets is, as can be seen in zones such as Planet Wisp, there's some sort of implied message about the effects of industrialization on natural environments, which is to say, it's a Sonic game with a simple story and light environmental undertones, just like it was back in the 90s. The final boss doesn't even require Super Sonic. Yeah, you know that guy, the, the, the Super Saiyan knockoff? Yeah, literally, it's just a simple Sonic vs. Eggman story, and the entire game can be beaten in under three hours if you aren't going for collectibles, but honestly, that's fine. In fact, it's great. The story is completely unobtrusive, and the game knows it. Seriously, when you start off the game, you're immediately thrust into Tropical Resort Act 1, and only after completing it are you presented any story cutscenes. It's just such a nice change of pace from the games that came before, and I, I just adore it. What the story lacks in depth, though, it makes up for in writing. For all of the dialogue here, Sega brought on a writing team led by Ken Pontak, a writer best known for his work on the darkly humorous Happy Tree Friends short. But he's also experienced with children-centric writing, with other credits including TV shows such as Lazy Town. That is to say, I feel that this story was in good hands, even if some of the lines come off as rather childish at times. It seems an evil man, and you might know him, who they call Baldy Nose Hair. <laughs> Baldy Nose Hair? That's the best thing I've heard all day! Even if not every joke or quip hits though, when a line hits, it's an absolute home run. Perhaps my favorite lines in the entire game are PA announcements done by Eggman that you hear as you run through the park. Yeah, they're intended as nothing more than background noise, but some of them are just hilarious. Perhaps my favorite line in the game actually is a PA ad done by Eggman one of the cutscenes. Come on down to the bucket of sushi! Now with fish! Actually, can we talk about how all of the voice acting here is fantastic? Some new voice talent was brought in for this one, and all hits home. Eggman has two new assistants in the form of Orbon and Cubot, and both are evolutions of the Ergo Robot in Sonic Unleashed. Sonic and Tails have good chemistry, and of course, as usual, Eggman is portrayed by Mike Pollock, and he absolutely steals the show. He's over the top evil and is quick to anger, but is handled in such a way that his portrayal just cements him as my overall favorite Sonic character. That's not to say there's not memorable lines from other characters though. Sonic's quip about how no copyright law in the universe will stop him made him a meme. In fact, it's a meme that I still see pop up whenever there's debates about copyright law and how it applies to the internet. On the topic of sound, can we talk about how phenomenal the soundtrack is here? Each zone consists of five or six main acts plus a boss, with the exception of Terminal Velocity Zone, the final zone, which is just two acts plus a boss. To keep things interesting, each zone actually has multiple different act themes. It's a cue taken straight out of the Sonic 3 playbook, and it's much appreciated. Just so you can get an idea of how phenomenal the soundtrack is, here are some selections of my favorite tracks from Sonic Colors as a whole.
And this game, of course, also has a vocal track as its main theme, with this being Reach for the Stars by the band Cash Cash. While Live and Learn from Sonic Adventure 2 will always be my favorite vocal Sonic theme, this is good stuff, and it's well worth giving a listen. But enough about presentation. As Sonic Lost World would later show, presentation means nothing if the gameplay isn't spot on. And thankfully, Sonic Colors delivers. From the first moment I started up in Tropical Resort Zone, I knew I was in for a treat. Sonic here once again has a gameplay style featured around his boost, which propels him forward in a supersonic burst that destroys everything in his path. However, Sonic's control here, compared to Unleashed, has been tightened and improved, and the boost itself has become much less spammable. Unlike in Sonic Unleashed, where your boost meter is filled up by rings found throughout each stage, here it's filled up by collecting these white wisp capsules. Rings are still present here though, but they're back to just acting as a means of allowing you to take a hit without dying, and, as usual, collecting a hundred of them will grant you an extra life. The result, though, is a boost that, though still very useful, must be used more sparingly than Unleashed. Granting color is a strategic element that especially comes into play if you're hunting for the red rings that are scattered throughout each stage. Sonic also has a few other moves. He has his homing attack, which allows him to home onto and attack enemies, kind of in the name, which feels the most responsive that it ever has in any game up to this point. It's also thankfully mapped to its own dedicated button here, unlike an Unleashed, where it shared a button with the boost. I can't recall a single instance in either of my playthroughs of Sonic Colors I did for this video, where I ended up falling into a bottomless pit due to a homing attack failure. Like in Sonic Unleashed though, Sonic is very stiff here. Don't laugh. Sonic has a very rigid jump. He doesn't go as far as he did in the classic games, but thankfully this is made up for by him also coming standard with a double jump here. And as a result, platforming sections here, of which there are many, on the whole are actually a lot of fun and don't absolutely break the pace like they do in a lot of other Sonic games. I should also mention, there's a few different control options available here. You can use a Wiimote and Nunchuck, a classic controller, or even a GameCube controller if you're playing on a standard Wii. Though, as I'm on the Wii U and have no way to use a GameCube controller with it, I'm just using this GameCube-styled Metal Mario-themed classic controller. It's actually pretty decent, by the way, even if I wish this was a bit more weightier. Now, back to the game itself, not present here is Sonic's classic Spin Dash move. It was one of Sonic's defining attacks in Sonic 2 and the Genesis, but it's just outright gone here. Also, it was gone in Sonic Unleashed as well, but due to the boost being more limited here, I felt more inclined to check out the other moves in Sonic's arsenal. Now, there is technically a way to get a Spin Dash move, and that's through the use of a pink wisp. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this game's big gimmick, wisp power-ups. Throughout the game, as you unlock worlds, you also unlock new wisp abilities that you can use in each stage by collecting these capsules. These are all temporary power-ups and, honestly, the vast majority of them are well woven into stage designs and often lead to alternate paths that can help with either speedrunning or collecting red rings. The Wisps come in several unique different flavors, and collecting them will grant you a temporary color power. There's basic white Wisps that just fill up your boost gauge. There's a Cyan Laser, which turns Sonic into a laser that can ricochet off walls and be directed through these blue crystals to find hidden paths. There's also the blue cube, which can turn these blue coins into blocks and vice versa, and again, this is very helpful finding alternate paths and red rings. There's the green hover, which both turns Sonic into a hovercraft and grants him this light speed dash ability, which allows him to trail along a line of rings, and like the homing attack, this feels more responsive here than any other game in the series. There's also the orange rocket, which turns you into, well, a, a rocket that shoots you upward, and is by far my favorite in the game thanks to the voice cut that plays whenever you use it. Rocket! There's also the yellow drill, which allows you to drill through the ground and water in certain areas, and there's spike, which just gives you a spin dash that can go along walls and ceilings. Seriously, okay, that, that one's kind of ridiculous. Sonic used to naturally have this move, so why does he now need a temporary power-up to use it? That's just lame. But, you know what, at least it does control well, and I do like all of the other Wisps. Well, okay, except for Purple Frenzy. This guy turns Sonic into a big purple berserker, and it controls like absolute ass. 
A couple of red rings actually require you to platform as a sky, which is a real issue as, the longer you use Frenzy, the bigger the Berserker becomes, and as a result, the game forces you to have input lag. Seriously, we're talking input lag of almost a second between you pressing the jump button and him jumping while using the sky. I hate using Frenzy so much, and it's a shame too as it actually has a really neat design. On the whole though, the Wisps are awesome and the stage design is fantastic. Though it's a 3D Sonic game, the majority of the stages actually consist of 2D sections. Even then, most of the 3D sections you come across either involve you just drifting around corners, quick stepping around obstacles, or just dispatching enemies, with most of the actual platforming taking place in the 2D sections. This would probably annoy me if almost all of the actual stages here weren't an absolute joy to play through. Going through zone by zone, the game starts off in Tropical Resort, a futuristic version of Florida that introduces you to the game's main controls and mechanics, not through forced tutorials, but through actual good level design. With that said, there is an option to turn on a navigator that will give you tutorial messages, but I think most players will be fine by keeping it off. Next up is Sweet Mountain, a mountainous planet made up of, well, candy! It's so cartoony and wacky and just... My god, I think this is actually the most visually pleasing zone in the entire Sonic series. Like, just look at this place! You're speeding through loop-de-loops made up of donuts! How could you not love this zone? Following that is Starlight Carnival, a zone that consists of spaceships flying through asteroid fields, anti-gravity sections, and these purple race paths that, though perhaps a bit more automated than I like, are an absolute treat to look at. Long story short, the entire zone looks like how people in the 1980s probably thought that the year 2010 would look like. Unfortunately though, the zone also contains the one level that I actually hate, and that's this one that forced you to bounce around these yellow springs. These things are just finicky and I end up accidentally falling off of them more times than I'd like to admit. This is the only spot in the game where I got a game over. Don't get me wrong though, the majority of the game is fairly easy, but it's certainly no cakewalk. Well, I mean, except for Sweet Mountain, which is quite literally a cakewalk. But this stage in Starlight Carnival, it's just annoying. I think the game would have benefited with its removal. After all, there are other stages in the game that do use these yellow springs, and they somehow aren't nearly as annoying. I will say this though, the rest of Starlight Carnival is an absolute blast to play. It's just this one stage that drags it down a bit for me. So let's talk about zone layouts. Most zones are laid out by having Act 1 being a longer act that truly sets a scene for each zone, with the following acts mostly being bite-sized platforming challenges. Most acts post-Act 2 in a zone will be under a minute long if you aren't going for red rings. While level links like this are something I complained about when I talked about Sonic Forces a while back, I don't mind them here as they are interspersed between longer levels and boss fights. And oh yeah, there's boss fights here! Yeah, these are the most underwhelming part of the game. Excluding the awesome yet easy final boss, Sonic Colors only has three boss fights, and all three of them are repeated. Also, all three are beatable in the blink of an eye. They all have memorable designs though, my favorite being this airship chase that really reminds me of Sonic Advance 2. But yeah, as for the actual fights themselves, they're pretty underwhelming. But do you know what is not underwhelming, and is actually arguably overwhelmingly awesome? Planet Wisp. This zone follows Starlight Carnival and it's a mix of vivid grasslands interspersed with industrial construction as all presented at a consistent frame rate and with beautiful music backing it. This one came back in generations for a reason and that version really makes me wish that Colors got an HD release at some point. It's just so nice to see a truly original grassy stage that has an identity of its own instead of just being Green Hill rehashed number 256. However, the overwhelming awesomeness doesn't stop there. Following Planet Wisp is Aquarium Park, which, get this, is a really great water zone. No joke, it has relaxing music and aesthetic that features elements of traditional Japan. Also, Sonic can actually swim underwater. Once you get used to how that controls, it's actually a ton of fun. It's kind of funny to see how far the series has come since the likes of Labyrinth Zone and Sonic 1. Aquarium Park Act 1 is easily the best water level in the entire series. Sometimes you even get these little fish that can surround around you and make a shield. I, I love it. From there, we get to Asteroid Coaster, which, well, features roller coasters that go through asteroids. 
This zone boost feels like it'd be a great place to hold a punk rock party, and it's also clearly intended to be the last of the main zones, featuring some acts that masterfully weave together elements from previous zones along with adding in its own mechanics. It's by far the most challenging zone in the game, and that's a good thing. From there, Sonic learns of where Eggman was keeping the captured wisps and finds out that he not only wants to enslave them, but also drain them of their energy to power his empire. So with that, Sonic rushes off to Terminal Velocity Zone, where after going through a straight shot through some mini-bosses, he confronts the Mad Doctor once and for all. As I mentioned earlier though, the final boss is pretty easy. But damn, that orchestral remix of the main theme combined with you finishing off Eggman with a combination of every wisp in the game leads it to at the very least being a memorable fight. So after kicking Dr. Eggman to the curb, Sonic then rushes away from the collapsing amusement park but nearly gets killed in the explosion. Thankfully, he's saved by the wisps, who return him to his planet safely, where he and Tails watch as the planets Eggman captured return back to their normal orbits. Eggman then monologues in space as his escape capsule is towed by Orbot and Cubot, vowing to return again in countless future Sonic sequels. Oh, and there's also a 15 minute long credit sequence, but I mean, also it's a credit sequence. Like, I mean, I have no problems with that being long. People deserve credits for working on stuff like this, even if they have a small role, you know? I mean, dang, it, it's, it's a credit sequence. But anyways, that's it for Sonic Colors for the Nintendo Wii. Yeah, it's not a perfect game, but a mix of overall great stage designs, tight controls, a very colorful and vivid and just pleasing overall aesthetic, and a story that despite being very simple, is also very entertaining to watch. This all just combines to make a game that on the whole is just fantastic. So yeah, I think that's all I need to say about it, really, yeah? Right. I need to mention Supersonic. So remember those red rings I mentioned? Well, there's 180 of them in total, and every 10 that you pick up will unlock a new stage in Eggman Sonic Simulator. These are challenge maps that can be played with a friend, and they feature either a Sonic robot or a custom Mii character wearing a fursuit running through stages based off of each of the seven zones. Gathering all 180 rings and beating all three acts in each zone will unlock Super Sonic, and that's actually pretty awesome. So the simulator stages are essentially bonus worlds that also function as a multiplayer mode and special stages. The control is still great here, and the level designs are solid, save for these quick step sections that are presented with the camera a bit too zoomed in for my liking. I should mention, by the way, the entire game has a fixed camera that can't be rotated, but that's usually not a problem. Anyways, the Sonic Simulator stages are all pretty good for the most part, and they can get a little chaotic with friends. Some simulator acts even incorporate level designs that are based off of Sonic 1 zones. Who knew? Labyrinth Zone is actually fun with the colors control scheme. And as for Super Sonic himself, he's just as much of an overpowered beast as he was in Sonic 2. And overall, it's a worthy reward for getting all of the collectibles. Honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing the Sonic Simulator come back in a future game. It's good stuff. Okay, for real this time, that's it for Sonic Colors on the Wii. This game just does so much right. So, so much right. You know, I know gameplay was refined a bit in Generations, and yeah, I think that the stages could have used a few more 3D sections, like actual 3D platforming sections, but what's here is fantastic, and I can easily recommend this game to pretty much anyone who owns a Wii or anyone who has even a passing interest in Sonic the Hedgehog. I think another reason though why I really love and appreciate this game is I see Sonic Colors as kind of being the last truly original Sonic game. Don't get me wrong, like, I've talked about Sonic Mania before and how that's my favorite game ever, but I'll even admit that a lot of that game's zones, actually like two-thirds of them, are all just based off of zones from other games. And yeah, I, I appreciate the series' roots, but I'm kind of sick of seeing throwbacks to them, you know? Sonic Colors really was the last original Sonic game. So yeah, that's it for Sonic Colors as, as a whole, right? No, it's not. Yeah. There's a DS version of this game, and it's a completely different game! 
Sonic Colors DS is fun and just as cheap and easy to find as the Wii counterpart. It's essentially just Sonic Rush 3, and features the boost gameplay, but in 2D. It's a good time. The music's great, even the cutscenes look good in compressed form, and the story is lightly altered so that Sonic and Tails will run into some of their friends from throughout the series throughout the duration of the game. Instead of the Sonic Simulator, there are actual proper special stages here that you control with a stylus, and they're pretty awesome. The final boss is also completely different here, and it's pretty neat as well. Oh, but you can't use Super Sonic in regular stages like in the Wii version, and I guess that's kind of weird. But there is an exclusive true final boss fight against the Nega Mother Wisp, Queen Mother of all Wisps, who's been corrupted and turned evil by Dr. Eggman. I mean, I, I guess the fight's pretty cool, you know, it's doing this whole 3D thing, though it kind of comes out of nowhere, you know? Still though, Colors DS is fun, can be beaten even faster than its home console counterpart, and if you're a fan of 2D Sonic but want something different than the classics, or if you just want a game that's easy to play in short bursts on the go, then definitely give this one a shot. Okay, that's it for Sonic Colors. I really want this video to kind of be a, a farewell to not just uh, Sonic reviews, but kind of review style content in general on this channel as I fully embrace the documentary style. So yeah, that I, I hope this video will placate people and get them to stop asking me to review every Sonic game ever. Yeah, I, I know it won't do that. Okay, well, I think I have an idea. There have been a ton of Sonic games since the series inception 1991, but let's just be realistic here. I can't do an in-depth look at all of them. So right here, right now, I'm going to just give an overview of all of them in brief. All the ones I know of and have played at least a tiny bit of anyways. And all the ones that actually count as video games. You know, no Sega Sonic popcorn shops or weird Tiger LCD games here. And when I say in brief, I mean 10 seconds average per game brief. So with that, let's jump right in and head back to the distant year of 1991. In the beginning, there was nothing. But then, in 1991, Sega released a game for the Sega Genesis that would forever change the course of gaming history. This, of course, was Streets of Rage. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess they released the first Sonic game as well that year. So, what is there to say about Sonic 1? Sure, it's a classic game, but it hasn't aged as well as many 90s kids think it has. However, if you're a fan of the series, give it a try. It's not as good as Sonic 2 or 3, but they're certainly fun to be had. The best way to play it is either through the Sega Ages port in the Nintendo Switch, or the Christian Whitehead and Simon Tomley mobile port. That's right, that updated version is by two of the same folks who worked on Sonic Mania, and it's unfortunately only for mobile devices. Then there was Sonic 2. It improves on Sonic 1 in every single way. It's an absolute blast and the only stages that suck are all of Metropolis Zone. Also, Tails is here. Play this one any way you can, though if I could recommend a version, once again I'd choose the mobile version, which again was made by Christian Whitehead and Simon Tomley. Yeah, seriously, the, these guys are great and the Sonic 2 mobile version is awesome and even adds in the fabled Hidden Palace Zone, which was a level cut from the original release. Following that in 1993 was Sonic CD, which fittingly was released for the Sega CD. Hey, you still don't have a Sega CD? Sonic has an updated moveset, having both a spin dash and this really cool super peel out move, but unfortunately the spin dash just doesn't feel right. It's kind of jank. Also, the soundtrack is different depending on whether you're playing the Japanese slash European version or the American version. But you know, despite all this weirdness, I absolutely adore this game. It's super unique and actually does a time travel gimmick well. Christian Whitehead also did a remaster of this one back in 2011, but unlike the Sonic 1 and 2 mobile ports, this one was also released on Steam and Xbox Live. That's definitely the best way to play the game, especially as it lets you choose between both regional soundtracks and play as Tails, and um, yeah, de definitely check it out. The last of the mainline Sega Genesis Sonic games was Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Meant to be one game, it was split sometime in development. Oh, and uh, this is the game that introduced Knuckles. To me, playing just Sonic 3 or Sonic and Knuckles is just getting half the experience. So as far as I'm concerned, it's Sonic 3 and Knuckles or bust. So following this, there was then Sonic 3D Blast, which conflicting sources claim to either be a mainline game or a spinoff. Overall though, 3D Blast is 
not a blast to play. But it is pretty unique. It's an isometric platformer where Sonic's tasked with saving these flicky birds. It also got a Saturn release shortly after the Genesis release. Both versions have fantastic soundtracks, but the Saturn version has better graphics and fully 3D special stages. I wouldn't recommend playing the stock Genesis version, however, I can recommend playing either the Saturn version of the Saturn Analog Pad or John Burton's Sonic 3D Director's Cut, which is an updated hack of the Genesis version made by the guy who actually headed development on the game originally. Here's an odd one, this is Knuckles Chaotix on the Sega 32X. It stars Knuckles and his merry band of misfits, the Chaotix. It's easy to play, but hard to find. Not a great game, but certainly unique thanks to its ring binding mechanic. But okay, with that, let's move on to some handheld Sonic games. The first of these was Sonic 1 for the Sega Game Gear and Master System, which was released around the same time as the Genesis version. Though, despite sharing a name, it's actually completely different from the Genesis game. I love this one though. If I had to recommend a version, I'd recommend the Sonic 1 FM hack for the Master System, which takes advantage of the Japanese exclusive FM sound chip for the soundtrack. If you don't want to play it though, at the very least, give that soundtrack a listen. Then, what better to follow Sonic 1 on Game Gear and Master System than Sonic 2 for Game Gear and Master System? Sonic 2 on Master System actually is fairly fun, even if it's really difficult. It also has some weird mechanics like these awful hang gliders, but it's pretty good, though the Game Gear version suffers fatally from screen crunch. Yeah, I know a lot of people have memories with that version, but if you're going to play this one, then you either play it on Master System or you don't play it at all. Now here's Sonic Chaos. This is a fun little game that's also really easy. It's short, just as cheap as most other Game Gear games. Tails is here and uh... Damn, I already beat it. Okay, here's a great one. This is Sonic Triple Trouble. Let me tell you, this game is amazing. It's by far my favorite Game Gear game and it's exclusive to the platform. However, it did get a fan-made Master System port and that's great. Really unique, this one. It has wonderful lively zones and a fantastic soundtrack. While Sonic 1 8-bit is also really good, Triple Trouble is fantastic enough that to me, it's nearly on par with the Genesis' best. But that, unfortunately, was followed by Sonic Blast. And it looks cool, but like 3D Blast, it's not a blast to play. Actually, I'll, I'll be honest, like 3D Blast was flawed, but like Sonic Blast and Game Gears, it's just boring. Next. Ah, Sonic Pocket Adventure. This one is just plain awesome. It's on the Neo Geo Pocket Color and it's kind of a best of Sonic 2 and 3. Also, thanks to that system having this really awesome clicky thumb nub, Sonic's control here almost feels better than the Genesis games. Check it out if you get a chance. And from there, part of the team who made that would form a company called Dimps and create Sonic Advance. Or as I called it until Sonic 4 came out, Sonic 4. Seriously, this game plays like a true successor to the Genesis games, and I'd highly recommend it to anyone. It even has a new playable character in the form of Amy Rose, who's a perfect character for those of you who wish you could play a 2D Sonic game that feels nothing like a 2D Sonic game. And as for Sonic Advance 2 and 3, well, both of those are fine, two more so than three, but I feel like as far as the trilogy as a whole goes, the stage design just began to slip in quality after one. Don't get me wrong, two is still a blast, even though it has some questionable choices, especially in regards to its Chaos Emerald system, but parts of three just have some real gotcha moments and just head-scratchingly weird design. I'd say Sonic Advance 1 and 2 are well worth playing, but can only recommend three to diehard fans who are willing to put up with iffy level design. I should also mention, Sonic Advance 1 got a release on the Nokia N-Gage as Sonic N. It's exactly the same as the GBA version, but with horizontal screen crunch. Yikes! Following that, Sonic Rush was released on the DS in 2005 and introduced what's now known as the Boost Formula. Speaking of that, the game itself is incredible, and even features a new character in the form of Blaze the Cat, though she plays very similarly to Sonic. I'd also honestly recommend it over its sequel, Sonic Rush Adventure, as while that one still plays well, it had an unnecessary exploration elements that do nothing but pad out the game. Also, Sonic Colors DS is essentially just Sonic Rush 3, and it's perhaps the best of these three games. The PSP got a couple of Sonic games as well though, and those were Sonic Rivals 1 and 2. These games are unique because they're so middle of the road in quality that I really can't say more about them besides the fact that they're just, eh. So, seeing as I mentioned Sonic 4 a little bit ago, here's Sonic 4. In 2010, the world was graced with Sonic 4 Episode 1, and two years later in 2012, we got Sonic 4 Episode 2. However, instead of feeling like true successors of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, these games just feel like rehashes of Sonic 1 and 2, with 1 being more so rehashy than 2. These games also have some wonky physics, though if you own both of these games like I do, you can get access to Episode Metal, where, you guessed it, you get to play as Metal Sonic. Eh, it, it's neat, I guess. 
Also, episode 2 totally baits a third episode at the end, but yeah, these games received lukewarm reviews at best, and it's understandable why. Yeah, you can pass on Sonic 4. Now, let's get into the actual 3D games. 3D marked a big jump for Sonic, and also, if I'm to believe majority gaming opinion as well, should have resulted in the series dying a long time ago. Seriously though, 3D Sonic games, on the whole, aren't nearly as bad as many claim they are. As I said earlier though, 3D Blast, despite having 3D in the title, is an isometric platformer. It's not truly 3D, though the Saturn did see the Sonic Jam compilation, which along with featuring ports of Sonic 1, 2, 3, and Knuckles, also featured a fully functional 3D Sonic level in the form of Sonic World. This one's actually a really cool one to check out if you're a diehard Sonic fan who also happens to own a Saturn. But the first real 3D Sonic adventure was, well, Sonic Adventure. This Sega Dreamcast launch title was Sonic's first true foray into 3D, and it was awesome, especially the Chow Garden, which was like a better version of Tamagotchi. Remember those things? You gotta remember to feed them or they'll die, just like real pets. It's certainly not aged as gracefully in all areas as some of the classic games, though. Some characters, such as Big the Cat, kind of blow. Overall, though, Sonic Adventure is still really fun today. Plus, it's gotten a ton of re-releases, so check this one out any way you can. And the same actually goes for Sonic Adventure 2, which was released right around the same time that Sega pulled the plug into Dreamcast. Yep, a, a whole two years later. This was also the first time that Sonic tried a darker story, and yeah, yeah, it, it's okay, I guess. All the stages that aren't called Security Hall range from being decent to actually being really fun. But yeah, the number one reason I can recommend this one over the first game is because it just has a better Chow Garden. Damn it, Sega, give me a new Chow Garden so I can waste my life away breeding and raising these rejected Pokemon again. Following Sonic Adventure 2, we got Sonic Heroes, which unfortunately did not have a Chow Garden. This was also the first Sonic game to be developed following Sega's departure from game console manufacturing. Sonic Heroes as a whole though has some really neat ideas and fun stage designs even if not all stages are created equally and some of them really overstay their welcome. Personally, despite these flaws, I enjoy this game and can recommend it, though I can definitely see why a lot of people don't like it. Then there's Shadow the Hedgehog. Ah yes, the official game of edgelords everywhere. This title is best known for being a Sonic game with gunplay and also being a Sonic game where Sonic says damn. Where's that? Damn fourth chaos emerald. A lot of people despise this game, but personally, I'm proud to call Shadow the Hedgehog one of my guilty pleasure games of choice. Now, let's skip ahead a bit and talk about Sonic and the Secret Rings. This game is based off of the Arabian Nights, was the first Sonic game on the Wii. I actually got this one the same day I got my Wii, and for about six months, I just had this and Wii Sports. But even as a kid, I recognize this as hot garbage, so basically I just had Wii Sports. Thankfully though, this travesty was followed by Sonic Unleashed in 2008. Technically there are three versions of Unleashed. The main one is the HD version, which had a lot of great ideas but also some weird aspects such as the Werehog, which played like bootleg God of War, and forced poorly implemented item collecting in the form of Sun and Moon medals. But it also brought the boost formula to the world in 3D and did so with flying colors. Seriously, the Unleashed Daytime stages are some of the best stages in the entire series, but if you want to play this one, I recommend not actually buying Unleashed itself, just buying Sonic Generations on Steam and then playing around with the Unleashed Project mod. But then, there is also the PS2 and Wii versions, or as I call that, Sonic Unleashed. This was made by Dimps, the same folks behind the Sonic Advance and Rush games, and it's a completely different game. It's not bad, but it's not particularly good either. Oh, and about that third version, uh, yeah, that was, uh, there, there's a cell phone version. And well, that's, <laughs> oh, God. Following Sonic Unleashed came Sonic and the Black Knight, a direct sequel to Sonic and the Secret Rings that most of the gaming world just took a big fat dump on. The game's not actually half bad, though. S seriously, I enjoy this one. It's flawed, yeah, but fun. It's cheap, pick it up, give it a try. Now, skipping around again, around this time, there was an RPG called Sonic Chronicles, a dark brotherhood for the Nintendo DS. And it sucked. Big time. Thankfully though, the later Sonic Generations was awesome. Well, by that I mean the 360, PS3, and PC versions were awesome. The, the 3DS game was pretty different and actually pretty decent, but it doesn't hold a candle to the HD versions. Honestly, as far as control goes, Generations is up there with Sonic Colors as one of the best in the series. The only reason I actually recommend Colors over this one 
is just due to colors featuring completely unique stage themes and designs, and all of the stages here being based off of zones from previous Sonic games. It's still an incredible game though. Seriously, play it, especially on PC where you can just mod it to hell and back. But then, following this was Sonic Lost World, a game originally developed exclusively on the Wii U, but later got a PC release? Okay. This is a game that proves that good ideas and charming presentation mean nothing if the execution is botched. This is a game I especially hate because it just has so many good things that make me want to adore it, but it has such finicky mechanics and BS stage designs that just ends up flying off the rails. And that's just the Wii U version. Seriously, for the 3DS version, which again is a completely different game, take everything I just said and multiply it by 10. Playing either version of Sonic Lost World just makes me feel sad. Oh, and finally for the main 3D games, we have the most recent mainline 3D title, Sonic Forces. Wow, this one was polarizing, but let me be the first to say, it's not bad. You can make and play as your own Sonic OC, which is neat, and Sonic himself controls pretty well, but the stages are also all really short, and the game can't decide if it wants to be serious or cartoony in tone and aesthetic. I feel a bit disappointed here too, but not in that upsetting way that I do with Lost World. No, it's more so that kind of disappointment you feel when you see your favorite band in concert and they just kind of phone it in. I mean, yeah, it's a good show, but where's the heart and soul? Well, actually I can tell you exactly where the heart and soul was. That was all in Sonic Mania, which came out earlier in the same year that Forces did. Born from the minds of Christian Whitehead and Simon Tomley, this game, especially in the later Sonic Mania Plus version that adds additional characters and game modes, well, it's just a big love letter to what people love about classic Sonic that also brings some new ideas to the table. I can endlessly replay it and, like in all wonderful platformers, I so often find new paths to take while running through the game. My version of choice here is the Nintendo Switch version because though the PC version can be modded to hell and back just like with Generations, I can take the Switch on the bus with me and play it and it'll still run buttery smooth. But now, let's dive into some spin-offs. And first off, I'd like to mention Sonic's first ever game appearance. Seriously, this was before even Sonic 1. This odd piece of gaming history, of course, is Rad Mobile by Sega AM2. Before he was racing through green hills for the umpteenth time and beating up robots, yeah, Sonic was just a humble air freshener. But things get so much weirder from there. One weird Sonic game that I did play a ton of is the much underloved Sonic Spinball. As the name implies, this is pinball and also garbage if you play it on Game Gear. The Genesis version's fun though, especially if you're in that video pinball mood. Following that, there's, oh uh, goodness, what was there? Let's see. There is Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine, which is Puyo Puyo but Sonic. There are a few spinoffs starring Sonic's trusty sidekick Tails. Let's see, Tails Sky Patrol on Game Gear, Tails and the Music Maker for the Sega Pico Edutainment Console, and Tails Adventure, which is the only one that I'd actually recommend because it's, I don't know, just a fun little adventure starring Tails and the Game Gear. Oh, speaking of the Game Gear, Sonic Labyrinth, anyone? Yeah, th this one's actually not only awful, but has nothing to do with David Bowie. Moving on to the Game Boy Advance, here's Sonic Pinball Party. It's pretty fun, but certainly nothing groundbreaking. I mean, it's better than Sonic Battle, which I can never manage to sink more than 20 minutes into whenever I pick it up. But do you know what spinoff genre seems like a natural fit for a speedy blue hero here? That's right, racing games. There's a ton of Sonic Kart racing games. For your sake though, I'll keep this short. If you only have a modern system on hand, get Team Sonic Racing. But if you have access to a 360 PS3 or PS Vita, get Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed. That's the best one, is better than Team Sonic Racing, and that one honestly feels like it has less character than this earlier title. Hell, it's even better than most Mario Kart games. But if you don't have access to a last generation console, Team Sonic Racing is still a perfectly fun time. Now, let's talk about a fighting game. Yes, there was a Sonic fighting game, in the form of Sonic the Fighters, released in arcades back in the 90s. I actually played this one in the Sonic Gems collection on the GameCube as a kid, and it's a novelty and nothing else. But then, there's also Sonic R, an on-foot racing game, also in the Gems collection and originally for the Saturn. It has a weird control scheme and a lot of people hate this one, but damn it, the soundtrack is great and I love this quirky little racer. Speaking of quirky games, here's Sonic's Shuffle, which is Sonic's take on Mario Party. But honestly, the only Mario Party that this is better than is 10, and that's just because it doesn't lock a third of its content behind an amiibo. 
Speaking of Mario, though, let's take a look at the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. Uh, games. The newest of these is Tokyo 2020, which is also the newest Sonic game in general at the time of making this video. I've played a tiny bit of that at a friend's place, and a bit of my own copy of Mario and Sonic 2008, which is the only one I own. I really didn't care for 08, but this new one is really charming and awesome, and I really do hope to pick it up sometime soon for myself. This one was also the final game developed by Steam Studio Alpha Dream, best known for the Mario & Luigi RPG series. May they rest in peace. Okay, but now, let's dive in some really obscure stuff. There is Sonic Dash for smartphones, which was subway servers but Sonic. There's Sonic Jam for the entire Gamecom, which was so terrible that I had to go look in the mirror and really take a long, hard think about why I'm a YouTuber and if I've wasted my life or not. There's also countless Sonic compilations and re-releases and all of the Sega compilations that just happen to feature Sonic games. The newest of these is a new Mega Drive mini console. It's honestly really well done, and an absolute must-have for anyone who wishes we could go back to a time that was pre-2001. I also need to mention Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric for the Wii U, a spin-off game that's infamous for being one of the worst Sonic games ever made. I actually did a documentary on the development of this one, and uh, now I just can't look at my copy without feeling sad. The Sonic Boom subseries saw two further releases following the Wii U game. There's Sonic Boom Shattered Crystal for 3DS, which is a very mediocre 2D platformer, and there's Sonic Boom Fire and Ice, also for 3DS, which is actually a very fun and underrated 2D platformer. For some reason, I also get asked a bunch to look at weird arcade games such as Waku Waku Sonic Patrol Car and Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, which are a unique piece of gaming history for sure, but are also tiles I don't feel comfortable looking at unless I can play them in a similar way to how they were originally intended. That especially goes for Sega Sonic the Hedgehog, as that game required a trackball to control it. I'd also like to mention some cancelled Sonic games. There is Sonic Extreme for the Saturn, another game with a tragic development story that I did a documentary on, along with Sonic Extreme with an E at the front for the original Xbox, which was essentially just going to be Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, but Sonic. But even if we didn't get those, at least we got the Kinect powered abomination known as Sonic Freeriders. And yes, Sega also did allow the release of Sonic Schoolhouse for Windows back in the 90s. This is a game that I constantly get requested to review. I actually probably get a few messages a week telling me to do this. But also, I know really poorly done Sonic games are funny, but really and truly, this is just a really mediocre edutainment title from the 90s that just happens to feature Sonic. This game has been memed on so hard that there's nothing of importance I really feel like I can add to the conversation on this title. Now, I know there is one big game I missed in that rundown, and that of course is Sonic 06. And I'll be honest, Sonic 06, especially the PS3 version, is the worst game I've ever played in my entire life. But the reason I'm not talking about that game today is because I think that Sonic 06 yeah, it's awful, but everything that could be said about that game has been said. I have nothing to add to that conversation. Yes, the game's a glitchy mess. Yes, Sonic makes out with a human girl at one point. Yes, the entire experience is very unsettling and awful. But also, you've heard countless other YouTubers say it before. Other reviewers, other critics, other people in general. Saying Sonic 06 is a bad game and then diving in deep and listing off a whole bunch of reasons why it's awful is something that's just been done to death since 2006. So instead, I want to highlight a different Sonic game. Another big Sonic game I left off that list, and that of course is Sonic Colors. Because when I talk about 3D Sonic games, I don't want people to, to, I don't want people to think of Sonic the Hedgehog and immediately go to the terrible games that have ruined the series' reputation. Instead, I want them to think of the really good, charming games that have a lot of creativity and heart behind them. And so that's why I don't want to give the spotlight to Sonic 06, and instead I want to give it to something great. And that something great is Sonic Colors. But anyways, with that ramble out of the way, I'd like to thank you very much for watching this video. What's your favorite Sega published game? Let me know why it's Streets of Rage 2 down in the comment section below. And while you're at it, why don't you subscribe to stuff we play for more great content like this. 
I'd also like to give a quick shout out to all my awesome patrons. That's Dylan Ola, The Golden Bolt, Justin Chipman, and the awesome Robert and Abby Hornerbrook. Seriously, shout out to Robert, Robert and Abby. Like, they sent me a sharp twin Famicom and a Sega Nomad. Seriously, I can't thank them enough. Y'all are awesome. And I actually have a video in the works on that twin Famicom. But anyways, with that, thank you very much for watching. Stay classy, and I'll see you next time.